All right, let's talk about weaning ventilated patients uh, from the ventilator. So let's say that a patient who's been hospitalized for pneumonia or something, and now he's uh, intubated and ventilated, and the numbers are looking good. So you do a spontaneous breathing trial for two hours. So what are some things you're looking for that indicates that they have passed the SBT? So the number you're looking for is 105, specifically rapid shallow breathing index less than 105. So more rapid shallow breathing is bad for the patient, right? We need fast, oh sorry, we need slow deep breaths, right? So if our rapid shallow breathing index is more than 105, patient is not ready uh, to be uh, weaned off of the ventilator, okay? Um, what if uh, the rapid shallow breath index is less than 105? By the way, I don't know why they just couldn't make it 100. It, ha it had to be 105, so weird. But anyways, so then you also have to look at a few other things. So they have to have a good mental status that will ensure that they're able to protect their airway when you do decide to extubate them. They have to show you a strong cough reflex uh, they have to have a few secretions and not like really like really bad secretions because that wouldn't make sense if you extubate them and then no upper airway lesions. Um, so if patient uh, fulfills this criteria, you extubate the patient. Uh, what if the patient does not fulfill this criteria? Uh, then you put them on assist control and you keep doing daily SBTs. Um, so let's say a patient, uh, you, you keep doing SBTs and they keep failing, but they're doing well on assist control. So after 10 to 14 days, you start thinking about tracheostomy because it's unlikely that they're going to be uh, weaned off of the ventilator. So they need a tracheostomy to kind of uh, help them transition into mm -hmm. long-term care. Okay. So moral of the story, uh, just... Uh, RSBI of less than 105 is not enough. You have to look for good mentation, good cough reflex, and minimal secretions, okay? So let's talk about peak pressures and plateau pressures of the ventilator. So I won't go into the detail, but peak pressure um, basically measures the resistance to flow of air delivered from the ventilator and the amount of pressure needed to inflate the lung. So think of airways, right? Um, the higher the peak pressure, the more pressure is needed to inflate the lung. On the other hand, plateau pressure are static lung pressures, uh, meaning that they give an estimate of the lung compliance, okay? And they're measured during an inspiratory hold. So what are some conditions that can cause increased peak pressure, but plateau pressure would be normal? So anything that blocks the flow of air into the alveoli. So biting endotracheal tube can increase peak pressure because now you'll need, like the ventilator will need more pressure to inflate the lung, right? Same with the bronchospasm. So if like bronchioles are tightened down and clamped because of bronchospasm, uh, you'll need more pressure by the ventilator to inflate the lung. Uh, same with mucus plugging. So if the, like the, uh, bronchiole has been plugged by uh, uh, like a mucus plug, then you'll need more more peak pressure to inflate the lung. So what are the conditions that can cause both increased peak pressure and uh, plateau pressure? So anything that uh, affects the compliance of the lung uh, means that they're gonna increase the plateau pressure. So uh, let's say pulmonary edema, so they're definitely gonna worsen the compliance of the lung. Uh, so the static pressure of the lung will be high. So, uh, and same with pneumothorax. So uh, in pneumothorax, uh, the, the air kind of goes into the lung cavity, right? So the plateau pressure increases, which means that the lung compliance decreases. Uh, so then uh, the, the, the baseline pressure of the lungs will be high. Uh, same thing with atelectasis, same thing with right main stem intubation, and same thing with pneumonia. Okay, let's talk about oxygen versus ventilation. 
So you intubate the patient and you put them on initial vent settings. So initial vent settings are usually FiO2 of 100%. PEEP is usually at 5. Uh, tidal volume is at 6 ml per kg and respiratory rate is at 14 to 18 mm. Okay. So then you get ABG within 10 minutes. Now you need to remember that the values that affect oxygenation are FiO2 and PEEP. These are the two things that affect the patient's oxygenation levels. And uh, uh, what things affect the ventilation? It's tidal volume and respiratory rate, okay? So you put them on initial vent settings and you get ABG within 10 minutes. Uh, let's suppose the ABG shows pH of 7.25, so like pH less than 7.25, that's acidosis, and high PCO2 levels. So what can you do? So you can do two things. Either you can increase the respiratory rate or you can increase the tidal volume, but we usually increase respiratory rate first, okay? Uh, we can increase tidal volume, but it's it's just easier and uh, safer for the lungs to just increase the respiratory rate, okay? What if you do an ABG and it shows uh, pH of more than 7.45, that's acidosis, and low PCO2, that's respiratory acidosis. So it means that we are washing off the CO2 a little too much. So remember when I said that uh, for ventilation, uh, two things are responsible, respiratory rate and tidal volume. So yeah, so you're absolutely right. You gotta in decrease the respiratory rate and you gotta decrease the uh, tidal volume and if those don't work you can always increase the sedation that way patient will take fewer breaths and this will help the hyperventilation okay so yeah to recap co2 is related to ventilation and ventilation is related to respiratory rate and tidal volume so if the patient has really high co2 uh, you uh, increase the respiratory volume or you increase the tidal volume as a last resort. If a patient has really low CO2, it means that they're hyperventilating. So you decrease the respiratory rate or you decrease the tidal volume or you can also opt the sedation to reduce the respiratory rate, okay? So what if you do an ABG and it shows PO2 less than 60? That's hypoxia, right? So what can you do? So remember when we put the patient on the vent, the FiO2 was already 100%. That's what usually happens. So if the patient is hypoxic, all you can do is increase the PEEP, okay? I mean, you can do a lot of things, but in this particular setting, you can increase the PEEP. So the PEEP will help the oxygenation and it will improve the PO2 levels to go above the 60 millimeter threshold, okay? So what if you do an ABG and PO2 is more than 90 mmHg? it means that you're you're making the patient hyper oxygenated which is bad because remember free radical injury from your usml step one so what can you do in that case so you can decrease the fio2 simply just from 100 percent fio2 you go to 80 percent and then you recheck the abg within an hour and that will solve the problem okay Theoretically, you could also reduce PEEP, but then that will mess with the whole ventilator, right? You need some kind of positive end expiratory pressure to keep the alveoli inflated. So yeah, try reducing FiO2 first, and then you can consider reducing PEEP, but not a good idea since we already said that PEEP is like at five centimeter of HO2. So what are some things that ensure that lungs are protected so like when we're ventilating the patient we don't want to overdo it right so in to ensure that the lungs are safe uh, you got to make sure that the tidal volume is low okay so the lower the tidal volume the safer the lungs are okay uh, same with peep okay you don't want to do too much of a peep because that can also damage the lungs. So in order to protect the lungs, you gotta look for PEEP and tidal volume. You could also reduce the plateau pressure. Remember, we just talked about plateau pressure. So like pneumothorax or pneumonia or pulmonary edema, these conditions can cause increased plateau pressure. So if you could take care of them, that will result in decreased plateau pressure, which is good for lungs, right? I mean, think about it. This is the static pressure. The plateau pressure is the baseline lung pressure. And if it's increased, then the lungs are 
at risk for like severe damage from ventilation. There are three principles to having lung protective ventilation. There are three goals. Goal number one, you prevent volume trauma, like the trauma from high ventilator volume. How do you do that? You reduce the tidal volume. That makes the most sense, right? Tidal volume is literally like the volume that's going into the lungs. So the uh, tidal volume uh, that's like the baseline is 6 ml per kg. But if you suspect volume trauma, you can go down on that, okay? Um, sometimes this can result in some hypercapnia because remember I told you CO2 is related to ventilation and ventilation is related to tidal volume and respiratory rate. So if you lower the tidal volume to protect the lungs, uh, you may cause permissive hypercapnia, which is okay in certain conditions, okay? Second thing is to prevent barotrauma. So trauma from increased pressure. How do you do that? You try to keep the plateau pressure less than 30, okay? Whenever the plateau pressure goes over 30, you gotta do something to uh, get it back below 30. And the third is to prevent uh, oxygen toxicity by setting the minimum FiO2 to keep PO2 at 60 to 90, okay? If PaO2, like the pressure of oxygen, goes above 90 mm, you gotta decrease the FiO2. Okay, so these three goals prevent uh, volume trauma by reducing the tidal volume and allowing permissive hypercapnia, prevent barotrauma by making sure the plateau pressure stays less than 30, and preventing oxygen toxicity by making sure that PO2 remains between 60 and 90, okay? Going back to the whole um, respiratory acidosis thing, remember when we talked about pH being less than 7.25 and having concurrent elevated CO2 levels, um, the, you can either increase respiratory rate or you can um, increase tidal volume. But respiratory rate is increased first, okay? Why? Because we just talked about practicing uh, like safe ventilation, right? So if you instead try to increase tidal volume that's going to cause volume trauma so that's why it's important so like board can ask you a question where they'll give you a scenario and patient will have respiratory acidosis and increase co2 levels and they'll ask what's the next best step and they'll give two options uh increase the respiratory rate or decrease the tidal volume so you'll click uh, increase respiratory rate right because if we increase tidal volume it can cause the volume trauma okay uh, but what if the opposite is true? So what if the patient actually has significant respiratory alkalosis with pH more than 7.45 and low CO2? So in, in that case, you go to tidal volume first. So you try to reduce tidal volume before lowering respiratory rate or deepening sedation, okay? So just try to remember this. Uh, respiratory acidosis, increase respiratory rate first. As respiratory alkalosis, decrease tidal volume first. Okay, the idea is to basically keep the tidal volume at the lowest wherever possible. So that's why the opposite contradicting scenarios in respiratory acidosis and respiratory alkalosis. Uh, as a general rule, increasing the tidal volume is probably never the right answer, okay? And I promise this is the last thing before I move on. I know it's confusing, but it'll make more sense if you like uh, solve a few questions or like uh, read from mixap or something. Um, for respiratory alkalosis, you try reducing the tidal volume first, that doesn't work. You try reducing the respiratory rate, then it doesn't work. You can also try uh, increasing the sedation. However, this is a last resort because deep sedation can increase the risk of delirium, debility, and prolonged mechanical ventilation, and may also compromise neurologic recovery and potential anoxic encephalopathy. So yeah, uh, try not to do that and only increase sedation as a last resort. So let's talk a little about massive hemoptysis. So this is a very serious condition. I would say this is an emergency because uh, personally speaking, I've seen one patient literally die within like hours to when he came into our care. So always take massive hemoptysis seriously. There is no particular range for it, but like if the question stem says the patient is bleeding massively, then it's massive hemoptysis. So what do you do? 
you of course stabilize them you like uh, try doing like uh, uh, icu admission and then chest x-ray but uh, how do you treat the bleeding you have to first look for the source okay so ct chest uh, to start with and then flexible bronchoscopy for localization uh, and then rigid bronchoscopy for treatment if you were able to find the bleeding source okay so if bleeding is not localized like you can't find the source basically you treat conservatively or close surveillance and very high mortality risk in that scenario but fortunately if you're able to find the source uh, if it's bronchial artery you embolize it using uh, interventional radiology but if like that's unsuccessful or patient keeps bleeding then you have to do surgery okay uh, basically life-saving surgery so always keep that in mind let's talk about lights criteria so um, I always try to remember and then I forget so uh, I feel like it's easier to remember like the exited exudative effusion criteria so plural protein over serum protein ratio more than 0.5 that's an exudative effusion or LDH from the pleura over serum LDH is more than 0.6 that's exudative plural LDH is more than two-thirds the upper limit of normal for serum LDH that's like the hardest thing to remember but you gotta remember it for the boards so all these criteria plural protein slash serum protein ratio more than 0.5 plural ldh slash serum ldh more than 0.6 plural ldh more than two-third upper limit of normal for serum ldh that ex exudative effusion so what are some causes so empyema of course and then if it's empyema then like the uh, thoracentesis will show a neutrophil dominant fluid and also sometimes positive gram stain or culture for the organism that's causing empyema chylothorax uh, look for increased triglycerides in the serum fluid or milky white fluid so remember to look for these uh, uh, words malignancy the cytology would be abnormal tuberculosis uh, thoracentesis will show acid fast bacterium in the afb culture okay um, so yeah these things are to remember because boards is not going to ask you just about exudative effusion. They'll ask you like what's the cause. So there are different things that I discussed that differentiate between different causes of exudative effusion. So let's say a patient uh, comes to you with shortness of breath. A month ago, they were admitted to ICU for pneumonia and septic shock. And uh, they put us like a central catheter. Uh, through the subclavian and uh, you know so a month later patient comes with shortness of breath and dyspnea you get an x-ray and it shows a, a pleural effusion and then you order a thoracentesis thoracentesis shows milky white uh, pleural fluid and tri triglycerides are more than 110 what's the diagnosis so that's what chylothorax is right so like i said milky white appearance of the pleural fluid with elevated triglycerides so what happened was probably um the the cvc placement from the subclavian ruptured the thoracic duct and that caused leakage of uh, um leakage of like the milky white fluid and that's called chylothorax okay okay 40 year old uh, african-american woman comes in with the uh, you know recurrent fevers and cough and chest x-ray shows high retinopathy uh, never traveled to southeast asia okay so what's the diagnosis yep sarcoidosis but everybody knows that so that's not what the board is going to ask you so what if the same woman one year later presents with the uh, like uh, these raised lesions on the extensor surfaces and also she's having uh, like uh, migratory pol polyarthralgia so sometimes joint pain in legs sometimes in uh, upper limbs and then also fever and the hyaluridinopathy persists so what's that that's a variant of sar sarcoidosis starts with an l i can never remember it but it's lofgren syndrome okay so it's it's a variant of sarcoidosis so 
Don't be fooled by migratory propylia, tralgias, and fever. Sarcoidosis can have that. Let's say a patient comes to you, he has uh, like bad COPD, um, and they're trying to travel to Hawaii and they're worried about flying. So they don't use oxygen at room air. So how do you decide if they'll need oxygen when they're flying? So what you do is um, you check their pulse oximetry at, at room air. If their oxygen level is more than 95%, they don't need any additional testing or in-flight oxygen supplementation. However, if the level is between 92 to 95% uh, and then uh, like they also have like bad symptoms, then they'll probably need uh, in-flight oxygen because you know, uh, like at higher uh, levels, uh, of the airplane uh, airplane flights like 35,000 feet the oxygen level drops and then they can develop hypoxia and like yeah it's it's bad so um, yeah or you can also send them for testing so there's a test called hypoxia altitude simulation test where uh, they can test by simulating the low oxygen conditions and see if the patient needs oxygen okay but anytime like if the same patient comes to you and you test them you test their uh, oxygen saturation on room air and it's less than 92 percent they absolutely need supplemental oxygen okay and on a similar note if another patient comes to you with end-stage copd uh, and they need more than four liters of oxygen at baseline like that's what they're on at home they shouldn't fly that's a contraindication because like how high can you really go on oxygen you don't have a lot of room if the patient is already on four liters of oxygen at rest okay so the number you want to rem remember is four liters of oxygen is a contraindication for travel okay what if the patient only uses one liter of oxygen at rest at home so then you have to increase the oxygen level by one to two liters while flying. So if they're using one liter at home, they have to be on two or three liters when they're flying, okay? All right, patient comes to you with a chronic cough and hemoptysis uh, and some chest pain that increases with inspiration. Uh, patient has a history of kidney transplantation um, you get a CT scan, it shows nodules with ground glass opacity, also called halo sign, and uh, cavitations with air fluid levels. Uh, you suspect there is uh, an opportunistic fungus involved, so you get a beta D glucan and galactomannan, both are elevated. Um, what's the diagnosis? Um, of course, it's a fungus and it's an opportunistic fun fungus, so starts with an A. Yep, it's in like aspergillosis, but the invasive variant. So risk factors for invasive aspergillosis, um, solid organ transplantation, stem cell transplantation, prolonged neutropenia for any reason, chronic steroid use, uh, any immunosuppressive conditions such as AIDS, you know, and what's the treatment? So, you know, invasive has the ver uh, the letter V in it. So the treatment would be voriconazole, okay? And then, of course, you got to fix their immunosuppressive regimen if they're on it. And if voriconazole doesn't work, then you take them to surgery and manually remove the, uh, like the nodules and the ground glass opacities. Uh, the hello sign is interesting. It reminds me of the video game hello, and that's how I remember it. For patients with COPD exacerbations, when do you give them antibiotics? I mean, we know about steroids and inhalers, right? So you only give them uh, antibiotics if it's the exacerbation is moderate or severe. So how do you assess that? Uh, three symptoms, either really bad cough or really bad sputum or sputum is purulent, okay? So it makes sense, right? I mean, cough and sputum are the two major things in a COPD exacerbation. So re really bad dyspnea and uh, uh, really bad sputum volume and sputum is a little pussy. So you have to have two out of these three symptoms in order for the patient to get antibiotics, okay? If the patient don't have two of these symptoms, that means their COPD exacerbation is mild and they don't uh, uh, need antibiotics. Okay, uh, and then there is also another criteria for severe COPD exacerbation. 
if if they're hospitalized or they're ventilated and intubated then of course that's severe copd and you need antibiotics okay so that's the latest criteria they're going with so i'll just remember that so a patient who has history of systemic sclerosis comes to you with dyspnea for the past six months you order pulmonary function tests and you're looking for what disease that's associated with systemic sclerosis yep interstitial lung disease so can you tell me the pulmonary function test values seen in interstitial lung disease so let's start with fev1 or fvc so that's uh, that will be normal because remember fev1 or fvc is reduced in obstructive causes but uh, ILD presents with a restrictive pattern. So FEV1 over FVC ratio would be normal. Total lung capacity would be reduced. That makes sense. Uh, FEV1 by itself would be reduced and FVC would be reduced as well uh, because it's a restrictive pattern, but FEV1 over FVC ratio would be preserved, okay? So try to remember this. Uh, what about diffuse capacity of carbon monoxide DLCO. So that's also reduced in ILD. That's actually how you differentiate between ILD and other diseases that can present with a restrictive pattern. On a similar note, um, what if a patient presents with the shortness of breath and you order a pulmonary function test and they have preserved lung volumes, like everything, FEV1 or FEC, TLC, blah blah everything looks perfect the only abnormal finding is the reduced dlco what's that so that means that it's a vascular cause right because the lung volumes are totally preserved and the diffusion ability of the carbon monoxide is reduced so that's pulmonary hypertension for you okay let's say a patient uh, admitted for covid three days ago now develops like an acutely worsening pulmonary picture and you get an x-ray and x-ray shows white out and the patient is not responding to um, BiPAP and they have to be intubated. Uh, what's the diagnosis you're thinking of? Yep, ARDS. So whenever you see a white out on chest x-ray, that's ARDS. So let's talk a little bit about ventilator setup in ARDS. So the main thing you wanna remember is that patients with ARDS will need high PEEP, okay? So especially the ones with like moderate to severe ARDS. So if you think of the, like earlier we talked about like starting a regular patient with PEEP of five, okay? But uh, uh, in ARDS you'll have, like in severe ARDS, you'll have to have a higher PEEP than that. It's not uh, very lung protective, but you gotta have a positive end expiratory pressure to keep the uh, alveoli uh, from deflating and uh, uh, just closing down, okay? Uh, what about some other rates or like other values? So like the tidal volume, you'd start at 8 ml per kg, but then you'll uh, reduce back to the normal values that we already discussed. So the normal values, can you remember from earlier this podcast? Yep, it's four to six ml per kg. Plateau pressure, uh, like as in every other patient, you'll try to keep it below 30. Uh, rate, uh, respiratory rate, you'll try to keep it below 35. Goal pH, you'll try to keep it over 7.25. Uh, and then what mode would be work best? So it'll be volume assist control, okay? Why am I telling you all this? Why is this important? Because in ARDS, ventilator induced lung injury is a major cause of mortality and morbidity. So how do you avoid the injury in ARDS? Uh, I mean, you have to have a higher PEEP. There is no other way around it. So you can adjust the other values, right? To ensure that the risk of injury is min minimal. So like we discussed, you gotta have low tidal volume vent ventilation. So try to keep it to the four to six level, four to six ml per kg of body weight level. Try to maintain the plateau pressure of less than 30. Um, of course, uh, tidal volume, low tidal volume uh, will result in lower ventilation and will uh, be associated with increased CO2 levels like hypercapnia. So the term we use for this is permissive hypercapnia okay so we're purposefully allowing the co2 levels to be a little high 
because we don't want to risk uh, uh, lung injury by uh, messing with the low tidal volume. So uh, that's some that's a bargain. So permissive hypercapnia is fine as long as the pH is over 7.20, okay? Let's talk about auto peep for a while. What's another term like the like the nurses use that term a lot for auto peep? Breath stacking. It's literally just that. So what if like the patient who's uh, intubated and ventilated before they can uh, exhale their current breath, the next breath starts. So what happens is like they're stacking their all their breaths one over another, right? So you come into the patient's room to do your daily rounds and you see this pattern happening on the vent. Uh, that's like you gotta have all the red alarms start going in your brain, right? So what do you do? So there are, there are a few ways to go about it. Uh, some patient like uh, sorry some attendings even recommend just stopping like turning the ventilator off what they're trying to recommend is reduce the ventilation okay so how do you do that i remember like i taught taught, talked about ventilation related to respiratory rate and tidal volume so you can reduce the respiratory rate or you can reduce the tidal volume and that will take care of the auto peep uh and if it's really bad you you just like turn off the ventilator for a while and let, let the patient uh, take spontaneous breaths. Uh, you can also theoretically increase the peep. That sometimes helps too. So auto peep or breath stacking treatment, uh, decrease the respiratory rate, decrease the tidal volume or increase the peep. Okay, try to remember that. That'll be a very classic scenario. And you should Google the, like the classic uh, uh, ventilation ventilator flow diagram because they can like put that in the board exam and ask you what what this is and what the best next step would be okay let's say you have uh, an intubated and ventilated patient for like four days now and all of a sudden their blood pressure shots up to like 180 and their heart rate shoots up to like 120 um, beats per minute and you rule out all other causes, you know, echo looks great, x-ray looks great, everything else looks great. What's uh, what's what's the problem? Actually, I'll, I'll throw another bone to you. So now the respiratory rate of the patient uh, starts to increase and like now they're breathing over like 30 per minute, okay? So patient on ventilator, tachycardic, hypertensive, and uh, tachypnic, and over breathing the ventilator setting, and look very agitated, like, I mean, of course, they're sedated, but like, they're, they're writhing and grimacing and look agitated, What what's going on? So, probably patient is feeling very painful, okay? So, uh, of course, they cannot express their pain, so, uh, sympathetic activation symptoms like tachycardia and hypertension and tachypnea as well as pain related behavior such as grimacing and agitation and writhing will be there so you'll have to focus on pain control so that's how boards are going to ask you what's the best next step and you click something that's pain pain control related okay patient comes in with uh, wheezing for six months and have never smoked and they're also having cough and they're also having throat tightness and choking sensation. You send them for pulmonary function testing because they did like have some smoking history of let's say 20 years. But to your surprise, pulmonary function testing is normal. Uh, and then on, on exam, uh, there was an inspiratory strider on exam and wheezing, okay? And then you notice something uh, on the pulmonary function test the inspiratory loop on the flow volume curve is has flattened. So that's some problem with inspiration, right? And of course, we already talked about the inspiratory strider and on top of that throat tightness and choking sensation. Uh, let me put in another clue for you. So they also have dysphonia, so their voice has changed. So what's the diagnosis you're looking for? Yep, that's vo vocal cord dysfunction. So other than pulmonary function test being normal and flattening of inspiratory loop on flow volume curves, you can simply just do lar laryngoscopy 
that could demonstrate vocal cord adduction when the patient takes a, a breath, okay? So that's diagnostic. So what would be the best next step? Uh, laryngoscopy. So keep that in mind for vocal cord dysfunction. But these classic signs and symptoms are too easy, right? So that's not how the question is going to be. The question would be something like patients who have had asthma and they're not responding to the maximum asthma therapy. So what to do next? So then you need to rule out these laryngeal or like upper airway causes, right? So it's not just vocal cord dysfunction. There's also tracheal stenosis. That's a part of the differential, right? So what would be the next step? Spirometry with flow volume loops. And then spirometry with flow volume loops, like I said, the inspiratory loop has flattened. You go for laryngoscopy, okay? Um, so let's say a patient comes to you with two months of hemoptysis and they've recently noticed uh, red urine as well. So that's uh, pulmonary renal syndrome, right? So there are two major diseases that you need to watch out for. So one is Wagner or granulomatosis with polyangitis or GPA because they, they really wanted to make it complicated. So they're the same diseases, okay? So the second disease is uh, antiglomerular basement membrane antibody disease or anti-GM um, antibody disease, okay? So what, what are some classic signs and symptoms of granulomatosis with polyangitis? So of course, hemoptysis, and then renal environment, so nephritic syndrome, and then of course sinusitis and uh, like all the nose problems like cartilaginous destruction. Uh, but that's not it. Uh, these are the classic, like the most common ones, but boards are not gonna ask you about that. Uh, you need to know more. So of course, ophthalmic complications are there. So ulcers and conjunctivitis are certainly possible. And then for skin, as with any other vasculitic disease, you can have leukocytoclastic angitis with purpura. So this patient, if develops purpura, I wouldn't be so surprised and it'll still be a GPA, okay? How do you diagnose it? Uh, start with chest x-ray, shows nodules, cavitations, and then you do a biopsy. Uh, side note, never ever click like nasal biopsy. That's just not very sensitive or, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's specific, but it's not sensitive. So nasal biopsy is never the correct answer. You will probably have to get a biopsy of some skin lesion or some like, like even kidney biopsy will do. And then what's the treatment? So steroids and cyclophosphamide or rituximab, okay? Wegener ends with R and that's how I remember rituximab, okay? Um, the second disease is the anti-GM basement membrane antibody disease. I would argue that uh, this is more destructive and more serious than Wagner's. Um, same thing, uh, hemoptysis and nephritic syndrome, but unlike Wagner's, anti-GM antibody disease does not have systemic symptoms. So it'll just be like, it'll be a pure pulmonary renal syndrome. You won't have any other like skin or nose or uh, eye involvement. It'll just be re pulmonary renal syn syndrome, okay? And then chest x-ray, you'll see pulmonary interf infiltrates, not very specific, right? Uh, so you'll also have to get renal biopsy and it'll show linear deposits of IgG because it's anti-GM basement membrane and antibody disease. So the name says that there is involvement of antibodies. How do you treat it? Uh, steroids, cyclophosphamide, but since this disease involves antibodies, you can simply do plasmapheresis as well. So like I said, it's a more serious disease. So if the patient presents with acute nephritic syndrome and then hemoptysis, uh, consider plasmapheresis to remove remove all those anti-basement antibodies from his blood. Uh, unlike Wegener's or GPA, where you can't do uh, like uh, plasmapheresis. And remember like the NCA, so it'll be uh, GPA will be CNK positive, okay? Uh, hope that helps. On a side note, what's PNK positive? So that's uh, Charg Cetros. We'll probably talk about it at some, some point. Both Wagner and anti-basement membrane antibodies can result in pulmonary hemorrhage, which is a serious crit like critical condition and ICU will be, will be involved 100%, okay? 
one more time because Wagner's is in essence a vasculitis so vessels are everywhere right so patient can have constitutional vasculitic symptoms and like even like uh, uh, leukocytoclastic vasculitis with purpura and we've already talked about ear nose and throat and eye involvement versus anti-gbm which is very very specific to either lungs or kidney okay hopefully you remember that for the boards let's uh, let's go back to spirometry with flow volume curves right so earlier we discussed how vocal cord dysfunction can cause flattening of the ins inspiratory loop on the flow volume curve okay so that is called a dynamic obstruction so inspiratory loop is flattened but expiratory loop is fine right what's a condition where both inspiratory and expiratory loops are flattened so of course any condition that can cause obstruction will cause troublesome inspiration and troublesome expiration right so the diagnosis that comes to the mind is tracheal stenosis okay so if your trachea is stenosed you'll have trouble pushing air in and pushing air out okay um, another thing that can happen is like extrinsic compression of trachea by let's say substernal goiter so if the goiter is big enough it can cause obstruction of the trachea and flow volume curve will show both flattened inspiratory loop and flattened expiratory loop. So keep that in mind, okay? So let's say a 21 year old male, super healthy, literally no medical history, gets into a car crash and is intubated and ventilated. You're the ICU doc and then two days after the admission to the critical care unit, uh, his blood glucose starts uh, spiking like you are seeing 250 and 280 and 300 uh, milligrams of deciliter and you get an A1C and it's freaking perfect it's like 5.5 which means that over the past three months the glucose control has been perfect and patient is not a diabetic okay so what's the diagnosis that's stress hyperglycemia so any form of stress i mean if you're admitted to the icu your body's under stress right but also like fever sepsis hypoxia anything can cause stress hyperglycemia so that's not what the board is gonna ask you they'll they'll ask like how you treat it okay so a few principles um intensive glycemic control is not needed the range you're looking for is 140 to 180 uh, anything that goes over 180 is associated with poor clinical outcomes and of course if the blood glucose is less than 140 then you all you you always risk hypoglycemia because remember patient is intubated they can't really eat you know so yeah and then how do you treat it um you know it, if it sustains over 180 you just go straight to insulin so like sliding scale or basal bullets or whatever you want to do oral agents are not uh, um, recommended because of their unpredictable absorption and like prolonged duration of action so like if you give an oral agent you never know like how much insulin uh, sorry how much blood glucose is going to react right uh, and then if uh, it's uh, not working like they keep having hyperglycemia over 250 you can also consider like an insulin infusion okay let's uh, quickly talk about pulmonary function tests in chronic lung diseases because they could get you uh, quick pointers in board exam so we got our fev1 or fec ratio we got our total lung uh, volume or tlc and we've got our uh, DLC or diffusion capacity for carbon monoxide. So let's talk about COPD first. So uh, right off the bat, what would be FEV1 or FVC? So it will be low, right? That's the hallmark of uh, any obstructive disease for that matter. Uh, what about TLC? TLC will actually be increased. Why? Because, uh, you know, air trapping. You know, patients are not exhaling as much air and that air is getting trapped inside lungs. So DLC will be increased. What about DLCO? So DLCO can be normal in early COPD, but like picture this, you know, as like with COPD, like 
large bullae, like emphysematous bullae start forming and the surface area of the lungs that can absorb the uh, carbon monoxide start to uh, go down. So the, the surface area reduced is reduced. So that's why in late stage COPD, DLCO can be low, okay? What about asthma, FEV1 or FEC? Of course, will be low because asthma is uh, an obstructive disease just like COPD. TLC can be normal or can be high. Why, can, why it can be high? Same reason as COPD. Um, DLCO uh, is usually uh, normal, okay? So let's talk a little about uh, restrictive lung diseases. So there are two flavors of restrictive uh, lung diseases. So interstitial lung disease, FEV1 or FEC, normal, absolutely normal, okay? TLC, decreased, okay? Um, why? Because, you know, lungs are restricted in a sense, so they're not allowed to expand as much in interstitial lung disease, okay? DLCO, decreased, why? Because like the interstitial, like all those fibrotic changes are affecting the carbon monoxide's uh, ability to diffuse across the membranes, okay? Uh, what about the other flavor of restrictive uh, lung diseases? So restrictive chest wall disease. This time the restriction is outside the lung, okay? So FEV1 or FEC, again, normal because it's a restrictive disease. Um, TLC will be decreased so we're like think of really bad ankylosing spondylitis or kyphosis or kyphoscoliosis or really bad uh, obesity hypoventilation syndrome uh, there is so much pressure on the chest wall or there is something wrong with the mechanics that the chest chest is not allowed to expand so that's why the TLC will be low and then DLCO will be normal because uh, whatever it is, it is outside the chest. It's not affecting the carbon monoxide's uh, ability to um, diffuse across the membranes. And then lastly, pulmonary hypertension. So FEV1 or FEC, absolutely normal. TLC, absolutely normal. DLCO, decreased. Makes sense, right? Because pulmonary hypertension is an arterial problem, like a vascular problem. It's not a lung problem. So uh, that's why all the parameters will be normal except DLCO and DLCO will be uh, decreased. So try to remember these. Uh, to summarize, obstructive diseases like asthma and COPD, FVC, uh, sorry, FVV1 or FVC ratio would be low. Um, <clears throat> Restrictive diseases, FEV1 or FVC ratio would be normal. Um, TLC would be abnormal in interstitial lung, uh, lung disease. It would be abnormal in restrictive chest wall disease, okay? DLCO would be low in pulmonary hypertension and that will be the only finding, okay? And, and keep in mind, this is for pulmonary arterial hypertension. We are not talking about like pulmonary hypertension that's developed from a lung disease. This is about like the primary sort of form of pulmonary hypertension, which is called PAH or pulmonary arterial hypertension. Sounds good. Okay. Right. Patient uh, comes with uh, fever, night sweats, uh, hemoptysis, cough. Um, last year they had a stroke and they have had uh, mild dysphagia since then. Uh, you do a CT scan, CT scan shows air fluid level. Um, what are we thinking diagnosis wise? So it's a lung abscess, right? So of course you'll, you'll do a CT scan, like I said, to kind of differentiate between other causes of air fluid levels. Um, so what's the treatment uh, for a regular lung abscess? Like we are not talking about like opportunistic infections. We are talking about uh, lung abscess in an immunocompetent patient. First line therapy is either ampicillin sulbectam or a carbapenem, okay? So, you know, if, if you've done your residency, you can, you know, like, like we, we have to get authorization from the ID pharmacist and from the ID fellow or ID attending in order to order, in order to get carbapenem or ampicillin both. So you, you can tell that this is a serious condition lung abscess can be very serious, okay? Uh, another thing is like they, the board can give you a question stem like this and then 
what's the next best step option a antibiotics and option b drainage so lung abscesses are an, an exception because they do not require drainage okay so do not try to drain a lung abscess you're gonna puncture the lung okay and it it will be useless so just try to treat them with antibiotics and uh, probably for a long time and uh, hope for the best okay no no drainage and uh, no incision and drainage for uh, lung abscesses so let's say a patient who has history of um, you know cystic fibrosis let's say they come with really bad thick blood tinge sputum and like daily production of this bad voluminous sputum and like for the past year they've had recurrent infections like recurrent pneumonias along with frank hemoptysis um what's a diagnosis you're thinking of cystic fibrosis patient with really bad sputum and recurrent episodes of pneumonia and like yeah so the diagnosis is bronchiectasis um how do you diagnose it so you don't need a ct scan of the chest you need a high resolution ct scan and that will show airway dilation so watch out for um these words in the question stem and then pulmonary function testing uh, I, probably will show obstructive pattern same as copd but the difference is the findings in the high resolution ct scan of the chest right another thing you want to do is to investigate etiologies i mean uh, for cystic fibrosis patient developing bronchiectasis that's pretty evident what the etiology is but if this develops in a patient uh, without a like a obvious uh, risk factor you gotta investigate more so like why would they develop bronchiectasis so you can get igg iga igm ige levels uh, respiratory cultures and rule out bronchial obstruction so you might end up doing a bronch okay and then treatment, um, basically treat the underlying cause and you order chest physiotherapy in order for airway clearance to allow the patient to clear their airways because like they're producing these high volumes of sputum and that's causing the obstruction and then mucolytics and then of course um, you know uh, antibiotics if the patient is uh, having like frequent exacerbations and go getting admitted to the hospital you gotta put them on a suppressive antibiotics so keep that in mind since we've talked about cystic fibrosis let's talk about another uh, you know congenital disease that can cause bronchiectasis as well so you get a 25 year old male uh, he has had pulmonary emphysema diagnosis for the past five years which is weird you know because he's 25 years old and there is no smoking history um, but uh, uh, you know his his liver function tests are all over the place so you got like AST of 200 and ALT of 300 and he doesn't drink alcohol so what's what one congenital disease that can cause early onset pulmonary emphysema bronchiectasis and liver disease start with an A alpha one antitrypsin deficiency okay so yeah that's that's another way boards can um, test you all right uh, i think this is enough for today as always you can buy me a coffee um, kind of help my raspy voice and i'll see you in the next one